and this is fashion accessories and trims. In this course, we will discuss in detail the relevance of accessories and trims in the fashion industry. The first unit is introductory and will introduce to you what the terms accessories, jewelry and trims mean. It will explore the need, the scope and the essence of fashion accessories and trims. It will help you classify trims based on their usage and discuss commonly used materials in creating accessories. The unit compares accessories and jewelry, their similarities and differences and their growth in terms of style, epistemology, value, functionality and linkage to personal values like self-worth. We also discuss the materials that are used to create these accessories, trims and jewellery. The second unit takes off from the first to provide in-depth insight into the world of trims that are used to create apparel and accessories. It will throw light on categories of trims such as sewing, finishing and packing trims. It will explain how crucial their roles are with respect to design, style and the functionality of garments. Here, we will also discuss the significance of value addition in products and how useful decorative trims are in increasing that value. Unit 3 and 4 will detail well-known accessories like hats, eyewear, ties, belts, bags and footwear, categorizing them by how they are worn. These two units will also sketch out the historical evolution of these accessories. They will list the various stages of development and their typologies. They will also show you how socio-political, cultural and economic changes in the society affect fashion trends. While Unit 3 lists accessories worn on the head and neck, Unit 4 describes accessories worn on the body. To offer more technical expertise, the units will also detail the anatomy of these accessories and explain the suitability of certain styles or materials over others. Unit 5 is dedicated to jewellery. The word luxury often finds place in discussions about fashion and jewellery unmistakably forms a big portion of the luxury segment. We will begin this unit by analysing jewellery and adornments with relation to fashion and the body. We, link, we will link back to Unit 1 to understand how jewellery has been used over time as a means of, of emphasising attractiveness. This unit will also list jewellery worn by women from head to toe. This list will also include traditional Indian jewellery as India's fascination with jewellery cannot be left untold. The vocabulary of fashion accessories is vast. While it is improbable to try and scrutinize every accessory men and women have ever worn or will wear in the future, this course attempts to initiate the learner into the world of fashion and style. In today's context, it is imperative for any budding fashion designer, accessory designer, stylist, writer, fashion manager, photographer or communication designer to know how the need to decorate one's body through fashionable attire replete with carefully coordinated accessories is a basic human impulse. This learning will enable them 
to understand, appreciate and contribute more to the fashion industry in both creative as well as industrial setups. To summarize, this beginner level course will aid you to dwell deep into the world of fashion and accessories, enabling you a better appreciation of the fashion industry. This is the module one of the first unit, which is all about introduction to fashion accessories and trims. In this unit, we will define what trims, accessories and jewelry are. We will explore the need, the scope and the essence of these accessories. We will discuss why accessories are in fashion, what is their value, their functionality and their linkage to personal and emotional values. Before we delve deep into the world of accessories, trims and jewellery, we must develop a basic understanding of the fashion industry and the terms that we will use in our discussion. We will begin with a simple question. What is fashion? Derived from the Latin word fazar, which means to make, fashion is the acceptance of a particular style, trend or look by a set of people at a particular time. Fashion is a reflection of social, cultural, political, economic, technological, environmental and artistic forces at any given time. Fashion is influenced by cultural dictates, by political regimen, by war, by recession, by a movie that comes out during a particular period. An interesting thing about fashion is that it's always changing. One day you are in and the next day you are out. Fashion is cyclical, that means it moves in cycles. It starts as an introduction, moves on to a rise stage, peak and then goes off into decline and sometimes even planned obsolescence. Fashion is a medium for self-expression. It has power to make a statement. We all remember the glasses of Gandhiji, Nehru Topi and Eva Hitler's moustache. Even though that was a part of his body, it still made a statement and a statement like no other. A fashion collection or a line could be a group of garments that is apparel, accessories and jewellery. They can be connected by a common theme a mood or a concept. Fashion is also influenced by how the society expects us to behave. It could be used for gender demarcation. It can also be used to showcase anti-gender mentality or you can be androgynous. A fashion trend refers to a direction and tempo in which styles, colors, materials and designs are tending to change. Are they beginning? Are they growing? Are they declining? If they are moving, at what speed? This word viral has become very popular in the last five years. What does it mean? That a trend catches up at an alarming speed. This determines the tempo of the trend. Political events, film personalities, dramas, social and sport events often influence fashion trends. Just before the Olympics, 
you can see a lot of sport influence fashion when a particular movie releases you can see the movie creating a huge impact within the industry movies like great gatsby to go to a hollywood movie made a great impression on the fashion trend of that particular year style is a demonstration of a mood feeling or personality trait or even my livelihood style is a particular characteristic or a look that is appearance using apparel and accessories styling on the other hand means putting together different putting together an ensemble that is clothes accessories and jewelry to create a particular look how do we style using fashion trims and accessories we will see that a little bit into the chapter overview of the global fashion industry fashion is one of the world's most important industries driving a significant part of the global economy according to the latest industry benchmark the mckinsey global fashion index the m g f i the industry reached a staggering 2 trillion dollar value in 2016 and is climbing fast in india textiles is the second biggest employer needless to say the internal competition in within design industries is fierce apart from scaling globally fashion companies have also been looking inward implementing changes to their core operations to create sustainable businesses from shortening the length of the fashion cycle to integrating sustainable innovation into the core product design and manufacturing processes and digitizing wherever and whenever possible they have been reevaluating the entire fashion system in the current scenario of socio political economical changes volatility has become the new normal you do not know what will happen tomorrow next month or even the next year unlike the apparel segment that is traditionally worked in longer cycles 3 months to 2 year cycles with definitive influences the accessory segment has always been at the fringes of evolutionary change according to the 2016-17 mckinsey report watches and jewelry is expected to grow just 1.5 to 2 percent this year this is a little worrying the luxury industry has suffered a bit and the slight change in growth is due to this reason On the other hand if you look at the positive side the affordable luxury segment something that was non-existent a decade ago will continue to grow and benefit from the consumers who are trading down from luxury as designs here are created to cater to the ever changing moods of both the fashionistas and their followers in mass also the lower end fashion industry that is the lower end costume jewelry and accessories based fashion industry is predicted to grow in a much faster way compared to the luxury goods industry why do you think it's so because these goods are much cheaper can be mass produced or designer handmade and can be created to suit the whims and fancies of the present times and the population they grow and sustain themselves at a speed that is not possible by the luxury industry impact of global accessory and jewelry industry on india traditionally the indian jewelry industry has been more local than global with people preferring to buy from local jewelers than big brands for instance if you had a wedding coming up in the family 
you would prefer to approach a local jeweller who will polish your heirloom items for you. One or two items may be reset, polished and clean. Then as times changed, people started exchanging their old gold for new gold. And this also happened at the local jeweller. But industry experts predict that by 2020, big players, that is the current chain stone owners, will emerge strong as global brands by procuring these small local stores and creating a standardized presence. This, while standardizes the quality, price and the availability of products in the industry, it will also bring in a homogeneity that might not really go well in the fashion industry. One of the important global trends in the last two years has been the revival of vintage jewelry. In the West, people have been collecting old pieces through estate sales and auctions. In Europe and Northern America, designers have also been designing pieces for youth that look like they just came out of your grandmother's jewelry box. However, this is very interesting to note in the Indian setup. Like I mentioned before, in India, whenever we have a new function or a wedding coming up in the family, we tend to exchange old pieces for new gold. And we think that we, by wearing modern jewelry, we tend to stand apart from the crowd. we buy gold as investment pieces, placing a lot of importance on the return value of them. It would be interesting to note how this trend changes with light to the global trend of collecting and reviving vintage pieces. Girls today who are getting married want to wear their mother's or grandmother's jewelry and even their wedding saris. This is not just a western fad. It is also happening in India. Thus, it would be interesting to note changes to this buying behavior in the next few years, both in India and abroad. Will the old Indian mentality influence the Westerners? Or will their act and thought for reviving old jewelry old accessories and even old clothes, that is vintage pieces, affect Indian buying sentiments. Due to the makers movement in the 2000s, handmade accessories and jewellery has been the biggest trend of this century. Though the movement started with the focus on the DIY, that is do-it-yourself ideology, it has led to the growth of artisan-made costume jewellery and accessories. Just like the West, the Indian audience has become keenly experimental and have taken to materials like resin, terracotta, silk thread, paper and wire in a big way. This tremendous growth has also refocused the precious jewellery segment to steer towards completely handmade jewellery once again. Many famous Indian jewellery brands are looking to develop exclusive collections where, which is based purely on handmade techniques. Many international brands are now focusing on handmade bags, handmade footwear and belts. The term handmade, handcrafted, hand assembled are increasingly being used in the fashion, retail and export sector. I've used this word 
accessories many times during our discussion up until now. Now, I would like to define what that word exactly means. What do I mean by an accessory? Typically, what do I mean by a fashion accessory? Up until now, I've used the word fashion accessories or the word accessories many a times in our discussion. What does accessory refer to? Accessory means that which accessorizes, that is, that which adds to or complements a person, a look or even a product. It can be an addition, a trim, a component that increases the value of the item to which it is added. The value could be simply aesthetic, functional or both. A fashion accessory is specifically an accessory that is bound by the doctrines of the fashion industry. Accessories can add color, class and style to an outfit. It completes the look by pulling together various textures, materials, cuts and moods. It is both aesthetic and functional. In case of a bag or a shoe, the functionality could be based on practical, that is, physical aspects. And in case of a turban or a scarf, it can bring about emotional or symbolic aspects. Now that we know what accessories are, can you name some fashion accessories for me? Let's start from the head. Hats, yes, and all sorts of headgear that include turbans. Hair accessories, wigs and hair extensions of course. How can I forget eyewear? Masks and veils. Moving on, we have Throat warmers, muffs and even ear warmers that we use in the winter season. We have ties which include bolo ties and traditional straight ties. We have scarves, stoles and shawls. We have belts and suspenders. Of course, bags, purses, wallets and cases. Pouches are also included here. Looking at the feet, we have socks and stockings. How can I forget footwear? All types of shoes and sandals. Watches, gloves and mitts. Kneecaps and leg warmers. Over centuries, fashion accessories have changed and evolved. Some of the accessories that we listed before are not seen in everyday use in our current society. For example, masks, even headgear and hats. We see only certain communities, certain cultures wearing them now. With rapid technological advancements, even gadgets are now considered as fashion accessories. You might remember the Walkmans and the boom boxes of the 1980s which were the it accessories then. Then came your headphones and then your iPods and then your brick cellular phones which slowly moved on into your slim Nokias, your flip phones, your Blackberry, then touch phones and now smartphones. Gadgets like smartphones, headsets, health and fitness monitoring Gadgets like Fitbit are the trendiest fashion accessories of this decade. Soon, as virtual reality takes over, VR glasses and related equipment will assume center stage as the it accessory or the must-have accessory of this period. Moving on, 
let us take a look at my favorite topic. What is jewelry? Jewelry is a form of personal adornment. It is worn as a social, cultural or religious marker. It projects one's identity. Earrings, necklaces, rings and bangles are commonly worn jewelry throughout the world. Much like accessories, jewelry can be used to make a statement of self-expression. translates to plaything. Jewelry can be divided into precious, semi-precious and costume jewelry. What is precious jewelry? Precious jewelry involves usage of precious metals like gold, iridium or platinum and precious gemstones like ruby, emerald, diamond and sapphire. The semi-precious category is largely made up of silver, verma, spelt vermel, pronounced verma, which is 24 karat gold plated 925 or sterling silver, and even plated metals along with semi-precious beads and stones. Pieces manufactured as ornamentation to complement a particularly fashionable costume or a garment is called costume jewellery. A brief history and evolution of jewellery. In the prehistoric times, man created jewellery out of shells, bones and claws. He knotted them together and presented them as jewellery. They were the marks of an achievement, of a kill or of status in the society. Slowly seeds, grass, reed and feathers were incorporated to create expressive pieces. The discovery of copper meant that jewellery could look like bands, scrolls, it could be wired together to join keepsakes in a previously unimaginable fashion. Discovery of metals like silver and gold changed the way man perceived accessorization. Early societies noted that gold did not tarnish easily and displayed a sense of permanence. Its shine and allure made it the most important metal of all 
and it was considered to be worn by the gods. The gemstones came next. When man mined these gemstones out of the earth, there were rough baubles, pieces, trinkets that were meant to be worn and set in metal. Slowly, we developed technicalities, abilities to cut, polish and even enhance these gemstones to make beautiful jewellery. Did you know that most of the cuts that are popular now in gemstones came into existence only during the Renaissance period? Slowly, as time passed by, Western societies accepted costume jewellery or jewellery that was created to match a particular costume. However, Indians are far ahead of the Western counterparts when it comes to this. We have always worn beautiful costume jewellery. Be it the flower jewellery that is mentioned in Abhijnanaya Shakuntalam, where Shakuntala is described as wearing matching flower jewellery. Or the tiger claws that were worn by our Rajput men to show off that they were brave warriors. Indians have embraced costume jewellery and made it as a part of our culture. In ancient times, along with precious stones, pearls and even glass beads were worn along with gold jewellery. Glass carbochens and stones were set into precious metals. The Kemp or the Vadaseri jewellery of South India is a fantastic example to illustrate this point. We will discuss more about the fascinating origin of many of these techniques and pieces when we discuss jewellery in detail. Now, let us move on to list jewellery that is worn from head to toe. How oh, can you wear jewellery from head to toe? Yes, if you were to visit any of the ancient temples in India, you will come across beautiful sculptures of men and women, of Apsaras and Yakshis and Kinaras, all adorned with beautiful jewellery from top to toe. Even the Western world doesn't languish behind in this. If you look at paintings, sculpture from the West, you can see that a lot of importance was given to jewellery. The Greeks prided themselves in wearing the most ornate gold jewellery. Jewellery for the head and face. What all can come under this category? Let us make a list. Head pieces, forehead ornaments like your tikka and mathapatti. Clips, barrets, hairbands, even your bindi is a jewel. Then onto the face we have nose rings, all types of earrings, ear cuffs, ear chain, face chain, cages for the face, piercings and masks. Moving on, let us list the jewellery for neck, shoulder, back and chest. First, what I can think of is a choker, followed by collar, necklaces and chains of various lengths, thicknesses and proportions, shoulder pads, neck cages, brooches, pins, tie clips, back chains, back tassels, pendants, lockets, pectoral rings and piercings breastplates and bibs. Some of, my, some of these jewellery might seem absolutely new to you. But they are in fact extremely ancient. Did you know that the Mayans used to wear pectoral rings and piercings in gold? The men wore such fantastic breastplates or in it were completely embossed. Many of them are now displayed as famous museums around the world. Jewellery for the hands and the fingers. 
we have arm cages, armlets, bracelets, bangles, cuffs, finger rings, slave bracelet which is a combination of a bracelet and a ring. In India it is referred to as hat full and of course corsages that are famously worn and shown in American movies that talk about school proms. Jewelry for the body, waist belt, hip chain, chatelaines and key rings or the hip chains, drafting tassels. Finally, jewelry for the legs and feet, thigh cages, garter and garter brooches, anklets, leg dogs and toe rings. That concludes the list of accessories from head to toe. Differences between accessory and jewellery While in a manner of speaking, the words fashion accessories are used to refer to both accessories and jewellery. They differ in technicality. As you might have seen in the accessory section, we did not include jewellery. What do you think is the reason for this? Accessories are those subordinate items or components that are added to solve a specific need or functionality. For instance, a belt is used to hold up trousers. It can also be used to define one's waist. A hat is used as protection from the sun or to add grace and sophistication to one's attire. Hats were commonly used in the beginning of the 20th century and even during World War I by ladies who wanted to show off their elegance. A watch is worn to show time. Glasses are worn to see clearly and so on and so forth. Regardless of the aesthetic, fashion and emotional value that accessories add, they have a specific functionality. This is the feature that differentiates accessories from jewellery. This doesn't mean there is no practical reason behind wearing jewellery or that they are simply for decorative purposes only. Indian cultural dictates often state how and why each jewellery is worn on the body. Bangles and anklets help in maintaining good blood circulation at the wrist and the ankle. Newborn babies are made to wear waist belts. This help in monitoring their growth. In South, these waist belts are known as Arignan Kairir or locally known as Arunakaira. These help us in monitoring how much a baby is growing and whether that growth is comparable to that age. It was also used to monitor the various issues the baby might face. This was necessary in a day and age where medical help was not easy to find. However, jewellery is used more for the purpose of ornamentation and to satisfy socio-cultural and psychological needs than practical functionality. Need and Scope of Accessories and Jewellery Now that we have defined accessories and jewellery as terms, let us explore the reasons why we need them. First 
फर्स्ट ऑफ ऑल डू वी नीड दम यस वी डू देर इज अ पॉपुलर सेंग दट क्लर्स मेक अ मैन आई वुड लाइक टू एड ऑन टू इट बाई सेंग दट क्लर्स माइक मेक अ मैन बट एक्सेसरीज मेक अ वुमन अगेन दट डज मीन दट एक्सेसरीज एंड ज्वेलरी आर मेड ओनली फॉर वुमेन अगेन इफ यू लुक एट इंडियन हिस्ट्री यू विल सी दट ट्रेडिशनली मैन हैव बीन वेयरिंग मोर ज्वेलरी दैन वुमेन इट वॉज ऑफन यूज टू सिग्निफाई देर स्टेटस पावर पोजिशन एंड स्ट्रेंथ बट बिफोर वी लिस डाउन रीसेंस वी मस्ट अटेम्प्ट एन अंडरस्टैंडिंग of why we wear them in the first place yes we wear accessories to fulfill a purpose maybe functional we wear jewelry to look good it is a decorative reason but the desire to wear them comes from deep within our psyche to understand this better let us take a look at one of the common management theories Maslow's hierarchy of needs In the 1940s American psychologist Abraham Maslow suggested the hierarchy of needs theory Visually it was a pyramid structure with base of psychological factors followed by safety love belonging esteem and self actualization at the top Maslow's theory offers input about human behavior and the motivation to act or react in a particular way to any given situation. A most basic need is for survival wherein we look for food, water, clothing and rest. Once our basic needs are fulfilled and only when they are fulfilled we look for safety and security so initially when we look just for a place to sleep we might later look for a house that makes us feel comfortable then we would like to bolt the doors of the house so that we are safe and secure a secure person whose basic needs are fulfilled looks for love respect and affection this need to bond creates relationship community having met those a man moves on to accomplish goals that makes him feel esteemed in this community why we all like to be loved respected and complimented by those who are near and dear to us having met all these basic and psychological needs man's actions are directed towards self actualization now let us take a minute to understand what this word means what is self actualization it is to think about what one's purpose is in this life and see what you can do to achieve them each one of us has a true creative potential and if we work towards a goal we can achieve something we can build something that are bigger than just ourselves our family and our community we can create a legacy for those who would come after us this is called self actualization but sometimes it doesn't have to be so lofty i might want to learn an instrument because the music pleases me you start learning how to play the instrument over time you practice and you become the best possible version of yourself you come you become the best musician that you ever are this is also self actualization maslow states that one must satisfy their lower level needs before progressing on to meet the higher level growth needs when a need has to be satisfied all our activities become habitually directed towards this need that we are yet to satisfy now let us take a look at access
accessories and jewelry through the eyes of Maslow and his hierarchy of needs theory. Wearing accessories and jewelry would wear, fall into our higher needs. For example, badges, symbols, crests are worn to show loyalty to a particular family, organization or group. Ties of certain colors, in the case of America and shawls in India, are worn to show political affiliation. Regimental ties are used to indicate which regiment the officer belonged to. Jewelry is also used to attract the potential mate by the way of showing wealth or of owing through giving gifts. Engagement rings, wedding chains, symbolize commitment and relationship. A gold watch, a diamond necklace indicates wealth, status and prosperity. It boosts self-esteem and brings about respect and appreciation of others. They also pertain to self-expression. Whether it's a pair of strappy silitos or a gem set traditional kundan choker, the things we choose to wear send messages about ourselves to those around us and perhaps on an afterthought to ourselves too. We believe that accessorization is a philosophy. That is, the act of wearing jewellery and accessories to ornament ourselves or to embellish is indeed a philosophy and as such must be treated in a way. Now, talking about philosophy, we have to consider its axiology, which comprises of two parts, aesthetics and ethics. The word ethics refers to the right way and in that sense, a wrong way of doing things. The word aesthetics refers to beauty or presentation or even sometimes the lack of it. Now, you might wonder, Jewelry and accessories belong to fashion, so there can be only an aesthetic component of it. Why are we concerned about ethics? We are talking about ethics here because of its functionality. Yes, jewelry and accessories have inherent functions. They serve not just physical functions, but also socio, cultural and economic functions. Let us take a look at these functions and discuss why we wear accessories and jewellery. We wear accessories and jewellery because of their practical function. They complete the look or the ensemble. They help define the look. They spice up the look and add interest. They help highlight your personality. They enable personal expression. They also consider or talk about symbolism. We also wear jewellery for cultural dictates. Jewellery and accessories preserve sentiments. They preserve our culture and heritage as well. Sometimes they help in preserving communicating and continuing the distribution of our arts and crafts. They are displays of wealth, status, money and power. Jewelry, particularly amulets and gemstone jewelry can be used for protection. Small trinkets can be used as good luck charms or as evil eye charms. They can act as conversation starters. They can be used to create a trend, generate a cycle, and boost your economy. Now, let us go back to this list and discuss each one of these points with relevant examples. Now, let us take point number one, which is functional use. We all wear accessories such as belts, watches, shoes, because they perform a certain function. A watch 
however fancy it might be, is useless if it does not tell you the correct time. A shoe, however beautiful, if it does not offer you the appropriate grip and protection for the sole of your feet, is in this case useless. A belt that does not hold up your pant, I don't have to talk about it at all. A hat is important when you are out travelling in the tropics. It helps keep your head cool and helps you enjoy the place much more. Now, your accessories that have functions are very clear. We buy products such as belts, watches, shoes, hats because they perform a certain function. These products are created, sold, bought and used mainly to fulfill this function. But what about products that perform indirect functions? Many ancient cultures like India describe pieces of jewellery with regard to their function. For instance, Indian married women wear toe rings. These are set to increase the fertility of the woman, aiding in faster conception and easier childbirth. In most states in India, a waist belt known as Aranyan Kaira in Tamil is worn. This is used ever since a, the child is a month old or sometimes even younger in certain communities. This is worn in certain rural communities in India until death and in certain communities till the baby comes of age. Now this belt is mainly used as a size marker. At a time and age where you could not really measure a baby's growth, these kind of tools or simple instruments that can be worn on the body served as indicators of the growth and development of the child. This skyr can be used to measure your girth. It also helps keep your weight in check. Now, coming to other pieces of jewellery like rings. Rings have been used as seals such as intalgio seals in the past. If you look at western communities, if you look at civilizations like the Egyptians, Romans, they all have rings which have also been used as seals in government documents. Functions of accessories and jewellery is endless and be interesting to examine the functions of each piece of jewellery and accessory that you own. Now coming to the second part. They say clothes make a man. I say accessories make up a woman. That doesn't mean that men cannot wear accessories or jewellery. If you look at portraits of our Raja Maharajas, particularly Rajput royals, you can see them adorned with beautiful turbans, beautiful waist belts and gemstone encrusted necklaces. Under the Mughal influence, men adorned their turbans with pearl tip heron bird feathers or a fan of jewels. Do you know why? Because it not only completed their ensemble or their look, but it also defined their look. So this tells us that jewellery and accessories not only completes the ensemble or the look, but it also defines your look. If you look at western subcultures like goth or punk, accessory plays a very important role. I love accessories that could be created out of found objects. Necklaces made up of safety pins or pendants made up of bottle caps have taken the world by storm. These are interesting products 
that you could do it yourself that is DIY or it can be bought off at high-end designer branded outlets now you ask me why do I need this is my clothing not sufficient is my personality not enough to describe what is it that I'm wearing human beings at the very core are visual and we do not like incomplete things. Jewelry and accessories help us in completing the fashion image that we create for ourselves. If you think about gypsies, can you imagine them without their beautiful beads? If you are describing a bohemian look, I am very sure that a hat and a braid or belt is definitely part of the equation. If you look at cultures like surfers, shoes are a very very important part of their look. Regardless of which culture, ancient, modern or postmodern that you are talking about, jewelry and accessories play a fundamental and crucial role in completing your look completing your ensemble and defining who you are and how you look to the world. This brings us to the next point. Jewelry spices up your look. Accessories add a lot of interest. Many of you must have heard of this word classics when it comes to fashion. A white t-shirt a pair of blue jeans, a little black dress, a black blazer. Now these are all my friends what I would like to describe as classics in clothing. They are very safe, they multitask, they can be worn by almost anybody regardless of the age, race, size, shape or color. But due to this uniformity they are also extremely boring. No matter how comfortable a pair of blue jeans and a white t-shirt is. And yes, you might want to live in them all the time. It is not very interesting. It will not help you stand out from a crowd in a party. It will not make you look fashionable when you are attending college. You need something extra to give you that oomph factor. Maybe a nice scarf, maybe an eye-catching beautiful necklace, maybe a pair of really cool shades or colourful shoes. Whichever you choose, correctly choosing your accessories and jewellery to complement your basic outfit can go a long way in making you look fashionable. Now let us take an example of a plain black dress often known as a little black dress. How do you make this interesting? Imagine that you are going for a party. How do you accessorize this little black dress? You could wear metallic jewelry. I would recommend gold for it's another timeless classic as well. Maybe a nice pair of gold hoops, a long gold chain that can be knotted gold pumps or stilettos give you this edgy cool factor at the same time make you look extremely elegant so you have worn this one day of the week and you have probably another gathering coming up and you don't know what else to wear you turn once again to your trusted little black dress and this time probably Pair it with a pair of red shoes, bright red lipstick and crazy red plastic bangles. It gives you a very funky vibe, makes you look a lot younger. It makes you look interesting. Now this could be a great outfit for an art gallery opening or a brunch with probably business associates. You might ask me, oh, isn't red too bright a color? 
it is bright but it also has to combat the boring attitude of the black in your little black dress so eventually it balances out giving you a great look now again colors like red and gold are safe and boring what else can you do instead of looking at color you can look at texture if it's winter you can probably wear a chunky scarf that is knitted say probably out of gray yarn gray is another slightly boring color but because of the texture it works very well with your black dress it can be combined with white stone studs or diamonds if you can afford them for of course diamonds are a girl's best friend diamond studs a plain silver finger ring either metallic shoes or dull gray suede shoes if it's winter again and you are living in a cold place i would suggest gray suede boots so this is a look that is safe elegant can be worn for formal occasions yet not boring because of the multitude of textures that we have used in the look so i could go on and on giving you so many examples of of how you could use just one black dress and derive multiple looks out of it a very interesting thing about jewelry and accessories is that it highlights your personalities and it enables personal expression picture a prehistoric man or a woman wearing bones claws and furs of animals and then he is wearing shells knotted together as jewelry now what does it say about that prehistoric man it says that he lives close to a sea and that he is a gatherer and he has techniques that are strong enough to drill holes in those shells knot them or bead them and display them as a source of wealth it shows not just his personality his aesthetics but also his skills i'm a bold quirky person so i love wearing classic simple clothes coupled with one of a kind bold jewelry when i go for a wedding reception i'm not dressed in the same silks and the same gold jewelry as everybody else recently i attended a wedding of a family member and i was wearing gota jewelry that is worn in pre wedding functions by the bride and you know what i received loads of compliments everybody came up to me and asked me oh it's so interesting where did you find it or when i told them that i made it they were extremely happy they not only complimented me but they said that it suits my personality it suits my personal exuberance and that it was different now being different or standing out is a tricky thing you could be good different or bad different choosing your accessories especially when you are mixing and matching them is a skill if you can style your clothes with well thought out jewelry and accessories it helps you bring about your personality but just because you want to stand out doesn't mean that you have to wear bold jewelry sometimes tiny pair of solitaire earrings or a simple just barely there thread like necklace can speak volumes about who you are about your soft nature about your elegance about your poise and about your grace now think of a man wearing a beautiful watch with a big dial and that is chrome plated now 
notice another man wearing a gold plated Rolex watch. Now think of a third man wearing a rubber strap watch. You will make some deductions about them based on the watch that they are wearing. You would see whether it goes with the clothes that they are wearing. Does it go with the way they talk? Does it go with who they are? Does it go with what is that they like to do? What story does that watch tell about the man who is wearing it? Isn't that an interesting question? I have a small activity for you. Next time when you get all dressed to go out, stop for a moment in front of the mirror, pause and ask yourself what each piece of jewelry or accessory that you're wearing tells about you. What is the story that it is telling others? How is it introducing you to the world? Is that story what you want to convey? Or is it something that is completely different? You never know. You might find out something very new and interesting about yourself from this exercise. So do give it a try. When we are discussing jewellery, any trinkets for that matter, symbolism becomes very important. Now what is symbolism? Symbolism is considering, gauging, valuing, understanding signs and symbols. Now symbolism in jewellery and accessories can be badges that is used to show membership or status or religious affiliation. If you've ever been a part of a Rotrack club or a Lions club, you would be given a pin. Members wear these pins to meetings to identify them as one person among the club. It builds a sense of community. There are other religious symbols too that we wear. For instance, the symbol of Om. Members belonging to societies and clubs such as the Rotra Club or the Lions Club are given pins to wear. Members wear them when they attend meetings. This promotes a sense of community, a sense of brotherhood or sisterhood amongst the members and it helps bond them together. Now let us consider some religious symbols. Representing the sacrifice of Jesus Christ, the cross has a huge significance to Christians. However, it has been used through the decades in jewellery and yes, in clothing too. During the Byzantine period, cross was a popular symbol of adornment and embellishment. It could be a metal pendant that was encrusted with gemstones. Apart from this religious significance, a cross symbol may also represent the four elements, fire, water, air and earth, or even the four cardinal directions. When this is worn as a pendant or earrings, it has immense meaning. But at the same time, the inverted cross or cross on a long chain has been used as earrings by the god subculture. They don't necessarily refer to Antichrist, but it is a comment on the Gothic period and its aesthetics. Many of you would be familiar with the symbol Om. Today, it is a pop culture symbol in the West, but it holds a lot of significance in India. 
There are many who wear the Om symbol as nose pins, as earrings, even as rings. They use it during meditation. It is said to bring a sense of calm and peace to the wearer. There are several cultural and societal dictates when it comes to jewellery and accessories. For instance, when the British came to India, they found it extremely odd that Indians, even the very educated and rich ones, were leaving the footwear outside the house, but refused to remove their turbans or headgears when they were in the presence of a king or a minister. They found it confounding as in the western civilization shoes were worn inside the house and palaces but hats were removed when bowing down to royalty or to an authority. Only after a long period of confusion did they come to realize that in India we often do the opposite. Now there are other cultural and social dictates too when it comes to wearing jewellery. For instance, wearing of the wedding ring in the West or the chain that showcases a marital identity like a Mangal Sutra or a Thali in the South. Now these, when worn, tell the society or pass a comment that the man or the woman wearing this particular ornament is married and therefore not available for courtship. Now there are other religious dictates also. Only members belonging to a particular religion wear particular religious symbols. I was just telling you how a cross could also represent the cardinal directions. But when we see somebody on the street wearing a cross pendant, we immediately assume them to be a Christian. When we see somebody wearing a pendant of a Hindu god or a goddess, we assume them to be a Hindu. Now what do these assumptions tell us? That these symbols are identities or proofs of a material culture which equates these symbols with a religious philosophy or a religious concept. The connection between traditional jewellery and religion in India is very strong. There are several mythological stories, particularly in Hinduism, that describe or give importance to a piece of jewellery. You must have heard about the epic Ramayana. There is a chapter where Hanuman, the monkey god, goes in to identify the place where Sita Devi is being held captive. So when he goes towards her, he approaches her he is worried that she might not recognize who he is. So he hides way up in a tree above her and observes what she does. And as she starts talking about Rama to her maids, he comes down and chants the Ramanama too. When he introduces himself, Sita Devi is not only curious but it's also cautious and ask him to prove that he is indeed Lord Rama's messenger. What does he do? He gives her a ring that was given by Rama and narrates an incident that only Sita and Rama knew about. In return, he gets her Chudamani or Rakudi, which is a hair ornament, to take back as a proof 
that he's seen her, talked to her, and that she's alive. In today's world, we call this proof of life. It's an interesting story, isn't it? There are other so several other socio-cultural dictates regarding jewelries and accessories too. For instance, wearing of a veil. Now this could be a burqa or a net veil that is worn by a bride during a Christian wedding or even a sehra that's worn by a groom at an Indian wedding. These traditions have been passed down in the society through centuries. Can you now think of few other cultural dictates regarding jewellery and accessories that is there in the community? Do discuss with people in your family, in your friends, in your peer group and your circle and identify five different cultural dictates about jewellery and accessories. Examine your own life. Can you identify a cultural dictate that probably you are forced to follow? For instance, whenever there is a festival at home, I am told to wear bangles, I am asked to wear a bindi and earrings. These are said to complete me, add to my shringar, make me presentable to the deities, to the gods and goddesses to whom I am submitting offerings. I would like you to examine and record these cultural dictates that runs in your family, your community and in your society in your learning diaries. These would be very helpful to you towards the end of this course. Jewelry and accessories preserve sentiments. Does your dad have a watch that you want to wear? Or probably a ring that your mother has that you would like to own someday? We like to have pieces of jewellery and accessories that is worn by our grandmothers, our grandfathers, our uncles, even our friends. When we are in love, objects of affection presented to us by our loved ones hold a lot of importance. A first hand misery gift or the first time your loved one buys you something that is indeed special and more so if it is a wearable ornament. Jewelry has been also used to preserve feelings, images and memories of other people. I don't know if you have heard of mourning jewellery. These are pieces of jewellery that have been created to honour the memory of a lost one. Pieces of hair, images, all photographs are cast or preserved in resin in the western world. Mourning jewellery is specially created to preserve the memories of a loved one whose past is by. After Prince Albert's death, Queen Victoria had special pendants made where pieces of his hair was set as pendants or as brooches and bone. Though usually the materials are coloured in black, colours such as blonde, beige, sometimes silver and red are all used to create mourning jewellery. Jewellery preserves culture and heritage as well. If you look at our bridal jewellery, you will understand how well they have served as documents of culture and heritage. They tell stories of the time when a particular material was discovered or a skill was developed. 
not only gemstones and precious materials but even everyday objects like floral garlands come into this category in south india brides wear something called pooja dai or pula jade during their weddings this concept of wearing flowers on your person on your wedding day is not just restricted to india abroad brides carry a bouquet in their hands this bridal bouquet is often wrapped with silk and then fastened with a stone encrusted brooch this brooch is later worn by the bride as a pendant or gifted to the maid of honor as a symbol of love and affection so why do we wear flowers during weddings flowers are the embodiment of life wearing flowers on your person is as equivalent to carrying a live thing it adds more value it adds more sanctity to the moment and makes it even more true and honest now this is a culture where we appreciate nature and ask for our blessings that is being imbibed in this art of wearing a pujada to give you an example of skill and heritage being preserved in jewelry i would like to point you to any of the traditional jewelry that you find in india whether it's the meena khari work of rajasthan and gujarat or the vadaseri temple jewelry of tamil nadu these are pieces of importance in every girl's trousseau they are passed down through generations handled admired used and yes worn with pride jewelry and accessories also preserve arts and crafts today shoe making by hand is a dying craft yes there are exceptional shoe makers who can make whip up beautiful pairs of footwear by hand stitching leather but it is expensive and not easily available to everybody who wants to wear them but buying such a piece of custom made footwear means that you are not only supporting the artisan you are also creating a repository a documentary of a craft in the form of tangible wearable heritage that can be preserved in neighboring countries of india such as nepal and tibet a piece of turquoise or coral is not on a string and carried as a protection charm amulets charms and trinkets have been used for centuries for good luck for protection for better health and as talismans many of you must have heard of words like tavis or dayat known as amulets in english being worn these could be anything from rectangular boxes to cylindrical small pendants that could be worn around the neck or tied around your upper arm they are usually worn as protection from evil spirits from negative thoughts sometimes even from illnesses another very interesting category that we have to discuss here is avoiding evil eye now evil eye is this malicious tear with disastrous consequences it is said to cause misfortune or ill health that is why a symbol also called evil eye is worn as a talisman to guard against these looks from tibet to greece evil eye beads ornaments and discs are well known 
in cultures and religions all over the world. You can recollect the concentric blue disc that you can see in Turkey. In India, Meenakari charms and Kauri shells are often used to ward off the evil eye. In China, warring beads and horn beads are used. Whatever the shape or form, these pieces of jewellery or talismans are used as protection. Sometimes small pennies or a clover or symbols of leaf, signs of lotuses are added on as charm bracelets or as charms to bags as symbols of good luck. These are usually bought and given as gifts and the goodwill of the buyer is also passed on to the user or the wearer. Jewelry and accessories also perform an important function of displaying wealth, status and power. Now, can you go to any wedding in India and see people with absolutely no jewelry there? No, right? Our Indian brides are known for piling up on jewellery. Why do they do it? Apart from the fact that they want to look good, the family also wants to impress the society by showing off how much of wealth they have, what is their status and what is their power in the society. And believe me, this is not a modern age phenomena. In prehistoric times, man learned to live by observing the nature and behavior of animals. In many of the species, the male tries to woo the female by dancing, singing, catcalling, peacocking and variety of means. So, man wondered, what could he do? How could he attract the most suitable, most attractive, most beautiful woman in the group to be his wife? And he started doing that by giving her ornaments that are worthy of her. Maybe a shell necklace, maybe a horned bangle, or furs from the hunt that he has just won. So a woman wearing more accessories and more jewellery meant that the man who was her partner was richer, was more powerful, probably even the group leader. Now, many of us tend to equate jewellery and accessories with treasures or possessions. We tend to invest in them as a means of providing for our future. The lines outside gold jewellery shops in India during Akshay Tridhi stands testimony to this. Again, this is not a new phenomenon. Some of you must have come across this word trade bead or slave bead. These were decorative glass beads created using the Millefore technique between the 16th and 20th century and they were used as currency to exchange for goods and services and even slaves to ease the passage of European explorers and traders mainly across the African continent. Now let me tell you a serious and probably even a very sad story about these trade beads. Now these beads were used in Africa as a form of currency. 
The most desirable and the expensive were small coral beads called the Khimara of Hamba, which roughly translates to food finishers. People used to starve to save money and sometimes even sell off their children to buy these beads. Why? These beads were so precious. They can be used to secure a seat on a liner that is going to the west. It can be used to buy favors, food, clothing, housing. And because people were sold to buy these beads, they came to be known as slave beads. In most tribal communities, wearable heritage is very important. They wear a lot of what they own on the body. Why? Due to their nomadic lifestyle, they keep on moving and live in shelters that are not meant to store wealth. By wearing it on their person, they can make sure that these pieces are safe, secure and can be passed on to the future generations. Now, we have to look at jewellery and accessories as a conversation starter. Like I said in the beginning, an interesting piece of jewellery or accessory can help you break the ice. For instance, take picture jewellery. Supposing you see your friend wearing a necklace with a picture of say Shah Rukh Khan or Rajni Gant. You will go walk up to them if you are a fan of either one of them and say, hey, that looks so interesting and I'm a fan of this person too. Would you tell me where you got this from? Maybe you might not become instant friends, but this is an interesting way to meet someone new, to get some new contacts, to talk to somebody who has the same interests such as yours. But it is always not possible to wear a picture around your neck and walk around. Interesting hats, interesting shoes, where two of you or a group of you are wearing, is wearing the same brand, is cause for community bonding. They help you make friends. They help you ease into a world if you are a newbie there. Finally, Jewelry and accessories can be used to create a trend. Today, in times of social media influences, where really anybody can become an influencer, styling your clothing, your look, with the right pieces of jewelry and accessories can really help you. They can generate a new trend cycle help businesses that are working on that particular product and as an end result you can end up boosting not just a particular craft segment or a business but the entire economy now through our discussions i hope you have some clarity on why we wear accessories and jewelry the list is exhaustive and I have only given you a few pointers. Like I mentioned before, I would like you to note other reasons around you, things that you find on social media, on the internet, in magazines, in movies, in your learning diary. These notes would be really useful to you when you are studying the culture around you and when you're attempting to style yourself and create a new look for yourself. The scope of accessories and jewelry. The fashion business is increasingly becoming all encompassing with more than just clothes. The huge increase in the availability of accessories and jewelry in terms of price, style, materials and design has given them an iconic status that was once 
allotted only to clothing. From being simply functional or purely decorative, they have transformed to items that have a strong narrative. Words like explorative, abstract, representative are a part of the new vocabulary surrounding them. Brands are now known for their accessory, for such is their scope. A Hermes scarf, a Chanel bag and a Cartier necklace are items of aspiration as they denote the epitome of luxury. Historically, only the rich and the famous had the luxury of dressing fashionably. But now, with accessories being available at every price point, it is no longer a luxury. It is a want that is slowly but surely transforming into a need. For millennials, unique accessories are a method to escape from being victims of banality. For an accessory designer, the scope is endless. With the increase in popularity of accessories in the market, their skills are not limited to the use of only one medium and can be explored across categories. With the rise of the maker's movement after the 2008 recession, handmade accessories have become the order of the day. There are several blogs and websites on the internet where crafters and designers freely share their knowledge of accessory and jewelry making with their audience. One has to only know where to look to learn how to make them. This DIY or do-it-yourself philosophy has led to design houses taking a closer look at their designs and their design processes. Their designs are now edgier, trendier and move along with the times. Many of these brands take their inspiration from the photos that are posted on Instagram and on Facebook. They are moving at a speed which the DIY tutorial creators are moving. Accessories and the spirit of the times. Accessories and jewelry have been closely connected to Zeitgeist, a German term for spirit of the times. They are indicators of what was in fashion or in use at a particular period in history. They also stand testimony to the development of skills, practices at that time and at that location. Kundan, Meenakari and Polki jewellery of Western India demonstrate the splendour by which the Rajputs and the Mughals lived in India. Early 1900s Western fashion plates show how lace parasols and silk satin shoes were the order of the day for women of wealthy families. The handbags of the 1930s and 40s are symbols of emancipation. According to experts, this was a period when women started travelling, moving away from their family and gathering items of value for travel became pertinent. Before that, men and women used to carry only small pouches or drawstring bags. The handbag became a symbol of an independent and a strong woman. Much closer in time are the colourful retro plastic jewellery of the 80s and the swatch watches of the 80s and 90s which showcase the loud, vibrant material culture of the period. Some of these products are available even today. But sadly, others like parasols have faded over time. Now, they are simply items of curiosity to be used as costume or collected as desirable objects of show. Accessories as a reflection of society. Accessories and jewellery are such an ingrained part of our society and culture that influence or inspire 
Greek literature. For instance, the five big epics of Tamil, one of the oldest languages of India, are named after, you're right, jewelry. Silapadigaram is the tale of an anklet or a silamb. Mani Mekalai. Mekala is a beaded hip chain that is worn by the dancer Madhvi, the mother of the protagonist of the story, Mani Mekalai. Shivakashantamani refers to a fabulous wish fulfilling stone. Chintamani is also a motif that is much revered in India and other countries of Western Asia. Valayapati, here Valaya means bangle. And finally, Kuntala Kesi. Kuntala is a style of hoop earrings. You must also be able to relate it to the Kavasa and Kundala that Karna used to wear in Mahabharata. Popular fiction isn't far behind in this regard. Be it Cinderella's fabled glass slipper or the rabbit's pocket watch in Alice in Wonderland or Minnie's polka dotted bow in the Disney stories. Accessories play an important role in establishing a character. Accessories like the iconic gold ring in the Lord of the Rings series or Hermione's time turner necklace in Harry Potter and Prisoner of Azkaban become crucial items that help move the story forward. The movie Titanic beautifully captured the emotions surrounding the heart of the ocean diamond necklace. There are many more stories, many more examples of how jewellery and accessory have affected us not just in the past, but how they continue to do so in the present and how they will impact us in the future. This is what I look forward to sharing with you in the future units. To conclude, unlike garments that are constantly bound by body image and issues of fit, accessories are freeing as they can move beyond age and size. Accepting very few accessories like shoes, belts and bangles, others are size independent. Also with accessories, age becomes irrelevant. 95 year old senior eclectic fashion icon Iris Apfel stands testimony to this fact. With her more is more mad fashion ideology, she has established the trend of seniors wearing multiple statement jewelry pieces and eclectic clothes. Though hats are no longer a commonplace accessory in modern society, senior fashionistas and millennials like Judith Boyd are trying to bring back hats in everyday fashion through Hat Attack a monthly celebration of hats and headgears on the internet. At a time when trends are analyzed and followed by consumers and manufacturers to establish an order in this frenzied world of fashion, accessories provide a breath of fresh air. They give us the opportunity to personalize our looks even when wearing mass-produced items of clothing. Trend forecasting companies like Promostel and WGSN rightly predict that individualistic accessories will be the third of force of the next few years. Artisan made, highly personalized, one of a kind accessories will slowly move from the fringes of the fashion world to mainstream society. This makes the understanding and appreciation of accessories and jewellery vital and congruent to the current and the future needs of the fashion industry. Introduction to fashion trims and accessories. Fashion trims and accessories are those supplementary materials that are used in a garment other than the main shell fabric. Even lining materials, accent fabrics used as patches, lace and embellishments fall under trims and accessories. 
buttons, sewing thread, lining are the most commonly used trims. The same trims can also be used in the making of fashion accessories like bags or hats. The metal components used in bags or shoes often closer related items like buckles, D-rings, tassel caps are referred to as hardware. Trimmings like ribbon, laces and thread are also used in making jewellery but here they are not known as trims. Along with other raw materials used in jewellery, they are simply known as supplies. In the western world, the usage of machine-made trimmings on garments became popular during the mid-Victorian era. This was a period when manufactured trims came to be freely available to the common dressmakers. Before, the trims were largely made and applied by hand and thus a heavily trimmed garment was associated with luxury and handmade opulence. Accessories in the fashion context The word accessories in English has several meanings depending on the context in which it is used. When it is used by itself in the fashion context, the word accessory could refer to a bag, belt, shoe or sometimes even jewellery that we have discussed some time back. These are accessories that can be worn or carried. To put them in a sentence, I have a few examples. I love the accessories that you have worn with an outfit, complimented a friend of mine. My bag is not just an accessory. It's an extension of a personality, I said in reply. But when the word is used as a production terminology in the fashion business, it means something completely other than what I just talked about. In the phrase fashion trims and accessories, the word accessory refers to items or tools that are used in the manufacture of the main product, like packaging tape. Difference between trims and accessories in the apparel or accessory production context. Though the words trims and accessories are often used interchangeably, there are small and subtle differences between them. Some experts claim that accessories are those that are not attached to the body of the garments by sewing, only used for the garment finishing. Then what about the other fashion accessories that we spoke about initially? See, this is not true in the shoe or the bag industry, where most of the items are glued onto the main product rather than being attached by sewing. So a simple and a valid explanation would be that accessories in the production context are materials that are not attached with the garments while using by the end user. These notions or components are supplies that simply aid the manufacturing process. So you might ask me why fashion trims are used? Are they required? Yes, they are. They are not just decorative, but they are highly functional. Let us list a few of the reasons why fashion trims are used. Number one, closure. Trims like buttons, zippers or hooks enable us to wear the garment and to close any openings that it might have. They are used to increase the usability of a garment. Imagine if shirts never had buttons or pants never had zippers or buttons or drawstrings. How would we simply wear them? Second, value. Trims are often used to add value to the garment. For example, ribbons, laces and patches. If you look at the traditional Indian garments, our ghagras and lehengas and saris, they are known for their ornamental embroidery patches and trims that have been used on them. They greatly enhance the look of the garment 
and they increase its value. Third, stability. Items like lining and interlining add shape and stability to a garment. Number four, shape and structure. Continuing from point number three, trims like lining and interlining help in creating shapes in a garment. They help a collar or a cuff retain its intended shape. Sometimes interlinings are used at the hem of skirts to create a hemispherical ball gown sort of a shape. Again, these are used in the lehengas and ghagras that I initially talked about. Linings and interlinings are also used to give shape, structure and add stability to a suit jacket. Now let us categorize these fashion trims based on their usage. Fashion trims used in production, that is, the making of apparel and accessories can be divided into three major categories. Sewing trims, finishing trims and packing trims. Sewing trims are those that are used during the sewing of a garment or an accessory. These could also include the making of an accessory. These include closure items like zipper, structure providing items like batting, pants and decorative items like patches and appliques. The main brand label that is attached to the product for primary branding and promotion comes under sewing trims. Now let us list some of these sewing trims. Starting with sewing thread, lining fabric, interlining, tapes and ribbons, cord, bias binding, elastic, patches, zipper, waistband, batting, frills and ruffles, tassels and fringes. Buckles are also attached during sewing. Other decorative patches and of course labels. Finishing trims. These are trims that are used during the finishing of a garment or an accessory. These include closure items like buttons and hooks and structure providing items like boning and stays. Now let's make a list. Starting with buttons, hooks, eyelets, rivets, stays, bonings, stoppers and drawstring. Packaging trims are those trims that are used during the packaging of a finished garment or accessory. These include items like tissue paper, pins, boxes, tags, etc. Promotional merchandise or visuals of how the product can be used are also included. Now, once again, let's list the packaging trims. Tags, stickers, supporting boards that help you retain the shape of a particular product. Barcode tags, tags, stays and other inserts. Clips and staples, poly bags, tissue paper, hangers, butterfly clips, pins, cartons and any other promotional merchandise. Some trims like buttons can be both functional and decorative while others like batting are purely functional. Patches are used for decorative purposes to add aesthetic value to the garments. Each of these three categories and their various subsets will be discussed in detail in Unit 2 of this course. Conclusion As we come to the end of this first module of Unit 1. Let us summarize the points that were discussed. Accessories are those items of value that add to and or complement a person, a look or even a garment. Fashion accessories have specific functions unlike jewelry 
which are largely ornaments. Fashion accessories and jewellery are dictated by the doctrines of the fashion industry. They can be aesthetic and functional, where the functionality could be based on practical, that is physical aspects, emotional or symbolic aspects. Fashion trims are those supplementary materials that are used in manufacture of a garment other than the main shell fabric. They are used to increase the wearability, the value, the strength and shape of garments or its components. There are three categories of trims, sewing, finishing and packaging. Trims can be both functional and decorative. That brings us to the end of module 1 of unit 1. This is the module 2 of the first unit which is all about introduction to fashion accessories and trims. In the first unit we discussed the basics of the art of accessorization. We saw what accessories and jewellery are and how they differ from one another. We also probed into the need, scope and importance of accessories. Here we saw several examples. In this unit we will go one step further by looking at how accessories are made. As an introduction we will list the various materials used in designing fashion accessories and jewellery. The secret to a fabulous look lies in selecting the right accessories. Knowing what to wear with what determines how you look and how others perceive you. Whether you are a designer trying to create your own accessories and jewellery or a stylist who must decide how to dress up their clients, a sound knowledge of the materials in which different accessories are made of will come in handy. This is even beneficial to the end user in determining how the pieces go with one another and how to create interest using visual and tactile textures in one's look. Don't we all want to look good all the time? To do this, we must determine how and what kind of accessories that we can wear with each of our looks that would not only be suitable for an occasion but will also suit our personality. In this model, specifically, we will focus on the overview of materials used for accessories and jewellery. This will include commonly used base materials or primary materials that you would already know of like fabric, metal or plastic. I would also shed light on the various trims and hardware used in the making of the products and the embellishments that make them classic, fashion or fad. Specific information regarding particular items will be shared in the future units as and when we discuss them. Before we begin talking about the various materials that are used, we must go back and revisit one word that I mentioned in the introduction. Texture. So what is texture? Texture is a quality of an object that we sense through sight and touch. It could exist as a literal surface that we can feel but also as a surface that we can see. Thus texture can be divided into two categories. Visual texture 
and tactile texture. Tactile texture. It refers to the tactile quality that is touch and feel quality of a surface. A surface could be soft, rough, smooth, pointy or fuzzy. Imagine running your fingers through a fur scarf or a fluffy woolen scarf. You can feel its soft texture. When you touch a studded shoulder pad, you would find it pointy with angular studs sticking out sharp. A classic Chanel bag will have smooth ups and downs brought through quilting depending on the quality of the leather. A pair of druzy earrings would have a rough granular texture. Take a look at what I'm wearing today. I'm wearing a plain that is solid red color tunic and I have chosen to accessorize it with metal accessories. Why have I done so? Because a solid tunic that to overall of this length could be slightly boring. By adding texture to it, I make my look both appealing and interesting. So let's take an individual look at all the accessories that I'm wearing because they all have a bit of texture in them. Let me start with the earrings. I'm wearing classic gold hoops, but these have a line texture in them. Though these might not be visible from a distance, they make the earrings look well made, beautiful and very interesting. Next, looking at the neck piece that I'm wearing, it is a hodgepodge of many different textures put together through a common color that is again gold. The cylindrical part that you see over here has a weave in it which accentuates the texture of it. It is further embellished by this pendant which have twisted wire running across it. Put together this gives an eclectic look not only to this particular neck piece but also to a person who is wearing it. Now, I have chosen to further accentuate my look through the use of other colors and textures. For instance, the lip color that I'm wearing goes with the kind of tunic that I'm wearing. In order to bring a sort of rhythm or a repetition to this look, I'm wearing highly textural bangles. This bangle is very similar to the weave that is there on the cylindrical part of my necklace. And this cuff that I'm wearing has vertical stripes which is similar to the earring that I'm wearing. Even though they are all made up of different metals, different materials and are in different colors, they all go well with each other because of the similarity and the interplay of textures used. Now let us move on to the next type of texture that is visual texture. Texture can also be portrayed in an image visually suggested to the eye which can refer to our memories of surfaces that we have touched. So while looking at the surface it could also trigger a sensation as though we felt it. Now think of a tree with a coarse bark. When you run your hand through the bark, you can find it poking your hand at certain places. It is slightly rough. Some places that is the inside is also smooth. Now this is tactile texture. If you take a photograph of that texture and look at it on a computer screen or on your phone screen, you will still be reminded of the texture. But this is visual texture. An image of the same coarse tree bark could be printed on a rexine bark. The rexine by itself is very smooth. But looking at the image, we are reminded of the coarse and the rough texture of the tree bark and not the smooth texture of the rexine. 
by using a combination of right textures, very interesting looks can be created. For those who like dressing up in monotones, that is tints, tones and shades of the same color. Without the use of contrast or accent colors, textures can play a very important role in providing interest. For instance, take a dull color like gray. Wearing an all gray dress could look very boring, almost some sort of a uniform. It can also make you feel very moody, slightly depressed or confused as these are the different attributes of the color grey. But if styled well, it could also make you look formal, professional and very chic. Now sticking the same example of a grey dress, you can include a chunky hand knitted shawl along with it which has a coarse texture, probably a slightly darker or a lighter grey, along with a patent leather belt maybe even metallic grey shoes or silver shoes and that could make the look extremely interesting. Criteria for selection of materials There are a plethora of accessories available in the market and the speciality is that they are all made up of very different materials. The selection of materials for accessory depend on many different criteria. Here are the most important of them. First and foremost, use. This determines where and how the accessory is used. That is a major factor in deciding the materials. The word where in this context has two meanings. The place where the accessory is worn to for example, shoes worn to work or to a party and wear on the body that it is worn, on the head, carried in the hand, worn on the feet, etc. For instance, a workwear bag would be formal and hence made up of real or faux leather like this bag here. This could also be used for casual and semi-formal purposes. Whereas, a purely casual bag could be made up of denim or jute. A hat would be made up of a textile material. Whereas, a bangle or a pair of earrings could be made up of metal. Also, accessories worn directly on the body will be made up of smoother and softer materials than those worn on the top of garments. For example, this bangle has embroidery on top of it. The texture is extremely rough and it is on a silk fabric. Even though silk by itself has a very smooth texture, when it rubs against the body, it might cause allergy or irritation in people who have sensitive skin. Hence, such a bangle is lined using felt. This artificial felt suits more skin, more skin types and hence it is used in lining of jewelry and accessories that are worn close to the body. So when this is worn on the hand, it causes no irritation. Imagine that you're going shopping, a major shopping free, spree with your friends and you decide to take a little handbag. But sometimes when you walk out the door, your mom or your friend will tell you, Oh my God! Why don't you bring along another bag? You don't know how much you're going to shop. Sometimes when you go to the beach, you do not want to take a fancy bag because it's going to get spoiled by all the wind and the sun and the sand. Then what do you do? You might take a beach bag that is made up of jute, but still cleaning that would be very difficult when you get back. In those cases, you get bags like these. Some of you would have seen this in the market. This little flower right here is actually a bag holder. When you open this, 
there is a shopping bag that pops right out of it. This bag is made up of waterproof material and it can be used in places where the bag will get wet. Also because it's literally tiny, it's collapsible and this folds and goes right back into the pouch. It can be kept in your bag for emergencies like that big shopping spree that I was talking about. This takes very less space in your bag and you can take it out when you've decided to shop for more items and then this can be your carry bag. Why am I talking about this? The material of this bag is a major deciding factor that contributes to the design. Such a unique design can be made only using the thinnest and finest of materials. Hence, a smooth, thin, synthetic material is very important in designing such a bag. Also, texture becomes very important when trying to choose a material. Let us go back to the bangle example. I have three bangles here for you today. The one that I already spoke about, embroidered one with a felt lining. The texture is beautiful due to the handmade and the machine made embroidery. Then let me show you another bangle that is made up of metal. They are similar in a sense that they are, have the same color. Shades of orange, peach and yellow with gold accents. But then this gives a completely different look. This gives a completely different look. Now let's throw into mix another bangle that is also made up of metal. While this is highly textural, slightly even rough, this is completely smooth and this has got a surface texture on it along with stones. Now, where can you tell me these bangles are worn to? This bangle definitely looks Indian. So it can be worn to a festival, a celebration or a wedding. This bangle looks extremely casual. So it goes well along with your jeans and your t-shirts. This bangle that is in between goes very well when you style it along with evening gowns and party wear dresses. Not that it cannot be worn to work or it cannot be worn to a marriage. But then when I look at it, I think that this is a party wear bangle. So not just where an accessory is worn on the body determines the materials. Also with what it is worn is very, very important. Trends are a crucial part of the fashion industry and they are cyclical in nature. That means that they will come and go in cycles or in waveforms. Fashion can also be classic or fad. The coming back of the 60s, 70s or 90s trends in the last decade is an example of this. Trends are styling ideas that have major collections in common. They have identifiable similarities across information sources. Materials are a major demarcation factor in trends. For instance, chokers of the 1960s and 70s were very much in trend in the 90s. Velvety neckbands with rhinestones in center was what was in vogue. This came back again in the end of 2015 and 16 and these materials that is velvet ribbon and rhinestones became in trend once again. Trends can be influenced by social, political, economical, cultural, environmental and technological changes that are happening around us. For example, the vegan movement has led to new fall leather materials like pineapple leather in the market. With PETA issuing a ban on real fur, it is no longer an in-trend material. With rapid urbanization, urban composites like cement and concrete are becoming a popular jewelry making material. 
just the last day, I saw an interesting documentary on how concrete can be used to create a variety of lifestyle and fashion accessories. There is also a brand of concrete called Shape Create, which many jewelry designers use across the world to create rugged, urban, chic looking, minimal jewelry. According to the WGSN Autumn Winter 2018-19 forecast, accessory trends will be about form following function. That is, the function of the object determines its form. Constructions and fastenings look like traditional hardware as well as more contemporary styles and the embellishments becomes ornate. So this means that traditional looking hardware that is metal hardware, brass, copper that is gold plated is something that you would see in bags and shoes. It also means that high level of embellishment will be visible in the materials. This means some sort of embroidery, rhinestone work, hand painting coupled with a lot of interesting textiles that are intricate and made by hand. The next important criteria is style and design. Style and design are closely linked with fashion trends. As per the same WGSN 18-19 autumn winter forecast, structure is predicted to be the point of focus for designs. Everything from bags to necklaces, from pockets to eyewear would have a structure to it. In this case, only those materials and hardware that support this or add to the cost of structure could be used to create the place target customer. In a designer's point of view, the target customer is of utmost importance while selecting the material. A high-end, luxury demanding customer would want the finest of materials that money could buy. But not every customer is like that. When a customer is on a budget, he or she is looking for the best buy. There, an economical yet value-based material is required. For instance, you are making jewellery and your customer likes the look of white gold or even platinum. You must see if you can replicate the look for less using high shine silver. The piece still remains semi-precious if not precious and has a heirloom quality. Also has a saleability point, but it costs fraction of the original price. Again, take an example of a silk necktie. Though it looks fabulous, not every man can afford to buy a silk brocade necktie. So the best bet would be to buy a tie that is made up of acetate or polyester. Not the cheap looking variety though. Today, synthetic fibers and fabrics can be treated to produce a variety of textures that look high-end without really costing a lot. Talking about cost, we must discuss how price is extremely instrumental deciding the material used in a product. Substitution of precious stones with synthetic stones in jewelry or silk with polyester in bags or in ties like I just explained to create a product that is suitable for a particular price range without changing the entire design of a product. For instance, the ring over here looks like a gold gemstone ring. When I wear it from a distance, no difference is visible. Even when I look close by, only a trained eye, that is a trained dweller's eye with a loop, will be able to find out that this is a synthetic stone and not a natural gemstone. But I get this ring at one tenth the cost of the original ring if a real precious gemstone had been used and if the ring had been made up of real gold.
materials are also decided based on the look, style and feel of the final that is the end product. Consider these two cute objects in my hands. Both of them are coin purses. Both of them are made up of the same green color. But this one is made using leather. This one is completely embroidered with beads on fabric. Though both of them have the same use, they look completely different from one another. The one purse has embossed leather with foil work on it. It's blingy, which means that it can be used for traditional occasions or for clients who like ethnic items. This on the other hand looks very fancy, to a point even slightly kiddish. This will be used by customers who like extremely intricate beadwork or things that are whimsical and quirky in nature. So what does this tell us? It is very important to consider the final output and the customer who wants that output when deciding a material for an accessory. Now, you might think, as an end user, how is this important to me? This indeed is important because as an end customer or as an end user, I need to know how to take care of my products. For instance, when I own the leather purse, I must make sure that I do not put it in water. I spot clean it. I keep it away from harsh chemicals. I treat it like the way that leather objects are supposed to be treated. When I'm using this purse that is beaded, I make sure that the beads and the thread in between do not get caught on any sharp object. So I always keep this in a place on my bag which has a very smooth lining. So as an end customer, I need to decide how well I can care for the products that I own. This will help me in picking up the right material. Materials used in accessories. The list of materials that can be used to make accessories is exhaustive and it is not possible to go over all of them at this point. Here, I would like to talk only about certain natural and synthetic materials that are commonly used in creating accessories. Other materials will be discussed as and when we come across them in the further chapters. Number 1. Textiles Textile products such as fiber, yarn and fabric are frequently used to make accessories like bags, belt and millinery. A fiber is a thread or a filament that could be from plant, animal, mineral or chemical sources. A yarn is a continuous strand of the fiber made up of many number of fibers which are twisted together. A fabric is a material or a cloth produced by weaving or knitting textile fibers. Interlacing of two sets of yarns, warp and weft is called weaving and interlooping of yarns is called as knitting. Commonly used woven fabrics in accessory and jewelry making are silk, particularly silk satin, Taffeta, again silk or polyester, denim, twill. And knitted fabrics like fleece and single jersey are also used. Canvas is a prominent material that is used to make bags, shoes and belts. You must have all seen and heard of the famous Converse shoes. Non-woven textiles like bonding and fusing materials can also be used. Net, lace and tulle also find a place of great importance in hat making. Non-woven decorative fabrics can be made using knotting, crochet or even plating and are used for making fabric jewellery. Woven fabrics are strong and durable and hence used in accessories where both strength and fluidity are required. 
bags, belts, sashes, scarves and stoles are often made of woven fabrics. Not that they cannot be made of knitted fabrics, but they are commonly made of woven fabrics. Fabrics like silk, acetate, cotton and even wool are predominantly used. Knitted fabrics are more stretchable and can therefore be used for fitted items like headband, gloves and hosiery. Industrial textiles and coated textiles also find a prominent place in the world of accessories. Vinyl fabric, Rexin and PU that is polyurethane coated fabrics are often used for making bags, shoes and belts. But when using fabric, we must also think of the end use and the end customer. I have two accessories for you that are made up of fabric. This is a drawstring bag, a pouch and this is a clutch purse. The first bag is made up of a shimmery material and it is embellished using ribbon embroidery. It's a drawstring pouch that can be used to keep your jewellery or your makeup products safe. Its soft texture allows to keep precious products safely inside your cupboards. So it can also be taken for outside use when you are out to a party. This clutch on the other hand is made up of a printed material and it has beautiful kanta embroidery on top. However, a purse like this with fabric by itself might not be that durable. It might also get stained. This particular clutch that I'm showing you is laminated using plastic. How does that help? It makes sure that this purse can be cleaned. You can just simply wipe it over with a wet fabric and your purse is good as new and there are no stains on this. The next material that I would like to discuss is leather. Tanned animal hide or skin is called leather. It could be dyed, printed or coated. It could be hairy or the hair could be removed via processing. It could be split into layers or segmented either before or after tanning depending on the end use. Leather is made from the external of the hide that has been tanned while suede is made from the underside of the hide. Suede is made from a hide that has been split. It has a softer velvet like texture. So suede is often used for those accessories that require a plush look. It also gives a very soft, worn-in and vintage feeling to products that are made out of it. Without tanning, both suede and leather cannot be worn as they will be too soft or too hard at extreme temperatures and are prone to rotting. Leather is often used to make bags, belts, shoes, wallets, gloves and even jewellery. It is a versatile material that lends itself well to many different forms and finishes. It can be dyed in a variety of colours. Most people when they think of leather shoes, they think that they can only be black or brown. You're wrong, my friends. Take a look at a woman's shoe section. You would see all sorts of delightful colors and textures. Leather can also be tie-dyed. It can be printed. It can be painted upon. It can be heat set. It can be wet molded. It can be used to create a variety of textures that you thought was possible only with textures textiles or with paper. Cow, sheep, lamp and buffalo leather are commonly used to make accessories. Exotic leather products can also be made. 
these are made using croc that is crocodile leather and ostrich leather. Leather gives a very formal and chic look to your accessories. They can be paired with both formal as well as party wear clothes. They look good as both day wear and evening wear and they work in all seasons. In summer you could wear leather sandals, in winter you could wear leather as boots and as jackets. The only season probably that leather doesn't work really well with is the rainy season as leather and moisture do not belong together. The next material and the most important material in accessories and jewellery is metal. All of you would have seen one accessory or the other at some point in your life that is made up of a metal that you know. In this section, I would be talking about the most famous metals like copper, brass or gold and other slightly less known metals. Metal forms the base of most precious, semi-precious and non-precious or costume jewellery. It can be used to create hardware and closure for bags and shoes and buckles for belts. Metal can be used in the form of a sheet or wire or can be cast into forms that become components. It could be made into embellishments that are decorative or only functional like stud bases or clasps can be made. Metal used for jewellery can be majorly classified into three categories. Precious metal, base metal and finished metal. These are the same classifications that are also used in the accessory industry. Metals that are rare and have a high monetary value are called as precious metals. They include well-known metals like gold, silver and platinum and rare metals like palladium and iridium which are special technical and electronic applications as well. India has a very strong history with gold. The allure that Indians have for this yellow metal is unsurpassed. We associate gold with wealth, with beauty and stability. Not just Indians but old civilizations all over the world love gold for they link it to stability, immortality and most importantly consider it as an offering to the gods. Only the most powerful, only the most prominent, only the most beautiful could wear gold in the olden times. Though it is no longer the case, wearing gold makes one feel beautiful, confident and full of energy. Gold purity is often mentioned in carrots. Carrot with a K. 24 karat gold is considered to be the most pure gold. But then this is too soft to be used to make jewellery. Gold is often mixed with a base metal like copper. 22 karat gold jewellery is what is common in India. 18 karat gold jewellery that is usually used to set diamonds in is what is used internationally. You can also use 16 karat and 14 karat gold which are much cheaper. They give the look of gold for less. However, the resale value of these pieces are very very low. Though gold is a much loved metal in India, silver is loved in the West. Known for its subtle sheen, its beautiful gloss and a finish which can be either shiny or oxidized according to the processes and techniques used. 
makes it a world favorite. There are many different kinds of silver. The common silver that we get, at least in Indian markets, is only 80 or 85 percent pure. Sterling silver, considered to be quality silver, is 92.5 percent purity. It is thereby referred to as 925 silver. Other kinds of silver include Karen Tree Hill Tribe Silver, which is 97% silver. Pure silver is 99% silver. Base metals. Metals in their alloys that oxidize, that is tarnish or corrode relatively easily when exposed to air or moisture are called as base metals. These are also used as a base for many different materials. They are abundant and therefore cheaper. They can be finished with plating, anodizing and other texturing techniques to increase their value. Base metals include aluminium, copper, lead, nickel, tin and zinc and their alloys include brass and bronze. Today, I am wearing accessories that are made up of precious metal that is gold, plated iron and nickel, copper and brass. So this shows that accessories made up of many different materials can be combined together to create a look. Moving on to the most common of these base metals, aluminium. Aluminium, being an extremely lightweight material, is used to create the base or the structure of many accessories. Owing to its attractive colors, brass is the most used material for accessory hardware. As it has a golden shine that can be matched only by gold, and it is available for a fraction of the gold's price, it is commonly used. It can be easily plated in gold for a luxurious sheen too. Some brands use plated iron, tin or nickel components to reduce cost. But they often contain lead, which is banned in many countries due to the allergies that it causes. The final part about metals, we are going to talk about finished metals. Base metals can be finished using a variety of chemical and mechanical processes to achieve an attractive look. Metals like aluminium and niobium can be anodized to get bright rainbow like colors. As mentioned before, base metals like copper, brass, pewter, iron or even bronze can be plated with gold or silver for an attractive finish at the fraction of the cost of a precious metal. When 925 silver or sterling silver or a 97 percentage silver is plated with at least 2 to 4 microns of 24 karat gold, the resulting metal is called verma, spelt vermeer, pronounced verma. Silver or gold fill components are usually made by bonding a layer of sterling silver or, 24 car or 14 karat gold onto a base of metal core which is usually a copper or a brass alloy and is finished with an anti-tarnish coating to preserve the shine. Due to the nature of this process, the layer of precious metal is much thicker than the film on plated metals, gemstones and stones. Stones or materials that can be set in jewellery and accessories come under the category of stones and gemstones. The term precious stones is traditionally 
used to refer to any of the four specific stones diamonds, rubies, emeralds and sapphires which are also known as cardinal gemstones. If you look at their origin there are only three types of gemstones diamond, beryl and corundum. Diamond the name by itself is self-explanatory. We all know the beautiful, lustrous, sparkling stones that are graded based on the three C's. Cut, clarity, color and carrot. Though diamonds are fully made up of carbons, they can be cut, polished or left uncut to produce a variety of looks and finishes. Emeralds belong to the beryl family. There is many a fascinating story about emeralds. One of the most famous story about a three strand emerald necklace that used to belong to Cleopatra. It is said that she put a curse on the necklace saying anyone who took that necklace to sea will not reach the shore. This curse or the myth has inspired many fiction writers, crime thriller writers to come up with their own storylines. Finally, the Corundum family. Ruby and Sapphire belong to the Corundum family. These gem, only these gemstones are known as precious gemstones. Now you might wonder how this classification was ever made. Initially, only those stones that were brilliant in colour and lustre and in case of a diamond the lack of colour is considered important were considered to be precious. The second point of consideration was that these were extremely rare to find and were considered to be in possession of mythical powers. Those stones that were dull and found in abundance during the early days came to be known as semi-precious stones. But over the course of time, the term no longer holds true. In the present times, the term has to do more with the import-export duties and the taxes that are levied on them. Some of the popular semi-precious stones are topaz, amethyst, citrine, tourmaline, coral, garnet and pearl. In India, we use gemstones for not just their colour and beauty, but also because we believe that they have other properties. Navratna rings are very famous in India. Each of these nine stones are believed to correspond to nine planets and said to bring in favourable influences. There are other stones which are known as rasikal. These stones are commonly known as birth stones in English. These, when worn by the person who was born in the corresponding month, is said to bring in good fortune, prosperity, good health, peace and happiness. Now let us look at the kind of stones that are available in the market. These can be divided into natural, treated, synthetic and imitation stones. Natural gemstones. According to GIA, the Gemological Association of America, which is the world leader in certification of gemstones. Gemstones that are found in the natural world without the influence of human activity other than mining it or cutting it are called natural stones. These stones are often dull, sometimes filled with errors, cavities or other natural inclusions. Treated gemstones. Many a times even the natural gemstones require human intervention. If they are dull, there are techniques to improve their shine and brilliance. Color and clarity can be enhanced using heat treatment. Thus, dyeing, heat treatment, oil polishing are considered to be the usual treatments that are made to natural stones. 
though these are explicitly not mentioned they are found acceptable by most jewelers and end customers across the globe synthetic gemstones now it is not possible to mine an ever uh, ever diminishing supply of gemstones in the world as we keep on mining them they diminish and their quality also diminishes so what do we do in this case do we stop making beautiful jewelry no we proceed to the lab where we can create fantastic gemstones but they will be man made a synthetic gem is a man made material created in a laboratory setting using the same chemical composition crystal structure optical and physical properties as the natural gem material synthetic gemstones are also sometimes referred to as cultivated or cultured it is very difficult to differentiate between natural and synthetic stones without expert consultation many a times just a look through a jeweler's loop is not enough in case you have gemstones with you do take them to a certified gemological expert preferably certified by gia to get your gemstones checked and verified synthetic gemstones are much much cheaper compared to the nat- natural stones but they can look exactly like them in order to make sure that you are not duped when you are buying them always emphasize on an authenticity certificate this certificate often issued again by a gemological agency like gia states the provenance the origin of the gemstone the weight color clarity inclusions and probably then even the names of the wholesaler or the distributor this certificate goes a long way in giving you assurance that the gemstone is natural and it's not synthetic next category of gemstones comes under stimulated gemstones you must have all heard of the famous american diamond or ad being used in artificial jewelry the technical term for ad is cz or cubic zirconia cubic zirconia and moissanite are common diamond stimulants that are used to imitate the look of diamonds however the word zirconia must not be confused with the word zircon which is a natural gemstone though they look like white diamonds and colorless like white diamonds they do not have the same chemical or light refracting properties of diamonds finally imitation gemstones typically made of glass plastic and resin using appropriate dyes these are used to imitate the color shape and look of a natural gemstone even the faults and cracks of a natural gemstone can be imitated via laboratory processes take a look at the li- rings that i'm wearing the one on my little finger is a stimulated gemstone and the one that i'm wearing on my ring finger has a resin or an imitation gemstone now you might ask me how did i know this so i need to take a closer look preferably under bright lights using a magnifying lens or a jeweler's loop if it is a synthetic or a simulated gemstone i would see the light refraction happening according to the properties of the original gemstone and in a resin stone i see air that is bubbles trapped inside the gemstone this is one of the many ways in which gemstones can be identified now if you take a look at this charm it is made up of plastic the stones on it are also plastic plastic is a very versatile material and after using it for the base structures and many accessories designers nowadays are using them to create small stones and details that can often work as embellishments rhinestones and paste also falls under this category 
Now, rhinestone could be a foiled back glass or it could be made using resin. Paste is a common street term for rhinestones and this term paste was commonly used between 1940s to 1970s all over the world. These are often used to replicate high-end designer pieces at a fraction of a cost. Now you would tell me why is there why are they legally allowed? Often dwellers who make high-end pieces do not wish to transport them for shows or when they lend it out to photo shoots or to celebrities they often cannot part away with an ex extremely expensive necklace or a pair of earrings. So what do they do? They substitute them especially the gemstones with fall gemstones like rhinestone and paste in this exactly the same setting so that the final jewelry looks extremely similar to the original one. Note I said extremely similar and not same because that would cause all sorts of problems. Plastic. During the late 19th and early 20th century, plastic became an important jewelry and ornamentation material. Even today, vintage plastic occupies a place of pride in costume jewelry designing. Some of you might find this very surprising because we tend to associate plastic with very cheap items like trash bags, like plastic molded chairs or other use and throw materials around the house. But plastic is an extremely versatile material. Not only that is, does it take colors beautifully, but it also brings out textures extremely well. A variety of finishes can be done to plastic. A lot of looks can be achieved no wonder that it is most sought after material by many many manufacturers. Case in point, eyewear. A lot of us think formal eyewear means metal frames, but that need not necessarily be the case. Take this pair. It's an example of a very common eyewear that you can see in the market. This is something that is worn as everyday wear by people who need to wear high power. Because it is made up of plastic, it is extremely lightweight and thus it is comfortable to wear in day in and day out. Because of the kind of finishing that is used in it, it can be worn by college students and even at a workplace. Even people at high place positions in a company can wear it. Compare this to this pair which is again made up of plastic. This is a kid's eyewear and comes in a fascinating color of yellow. So this shows how well the material takes color. Again this is lightweight because it enables the child to do anything he or she wants. Also because it is, doesn't react to water. So the kid can go around, play, come back, wash his face, nothing will happen to the eyewear. The most common type of plastics that are used in jewelry making are acrylic, lucite, bakelite, vulcanite, galilith, gutta percha and celluloid. Apart from acrylic, the other plastics are referred to as vintage plastic as they were very popular between 1920s and 1940s in the West. Lucite in particular can be commonly found in earrings, especially floral earrings of that period. Designers like Auguste Bonas, Coco Chanel and Elsa Schiaparelli created a name for themselves by creating unique, economic yet highly fashionable pieces using plastic. Resin. Resin is a naturally occurring or synthetically generated viscous liquid which hardens or cures on treatment. 
it can be manufactured in a lab for casting or doming purposes. Apart from being an excellent casting agent, resin can be successfully used to seal items, dome over paper and textiles, embed or preserve items. It can also be used as an extremely strong adhesive. From matte to shiny, from metallic to rough, many different finishes can be created using resin. It can be mixed with innumerable colors and multifarious textures can be created. Popular plant resins used in jewelry and accessories include pine sap and amber. Synthetic resins can be categorized into one part and two part epoxy resin. One part resin also called as UV resin hardens within minutes when placed under direct sunlight or UV lamp and cures in anywhere from 10 minutes to an hour. It is excellent as a sealant and for doming, but it is not recommended for casting. The two parts consist of a base resin and a hardener, that is a resin and a catalyst. By themselves, they are inert compounds, but when mixed, a chemical reaction occurs by which heat is generated. This heat helps the molecules bond and they sit within 2 to 6 hours. They cure anywhere between 6 to 72 hours depending on their chemical composition. There are many different kinds of two part resins that are available in the market. Polyurethane. It is mixed in 1 is to 1 ratio, that is, one part resin is to one part hardener and cures very fast. It can be used to create small decor items for indoor use and maybe even opaque jewelry. It is a bit cheap and is commonly found in markets. Sometimes what you think of as plastic is actually polyurethane resin. Epoxy. It is the most use of all resins in jewelry making. As it can be made clear, translucent or opaque. There is also a jewelry grade resin called as clear casting resin. This is used to achieve glass like clarity mixed in either 1 is to 1, 2 is to 1, 1 is to 4 ratio. It is a slow curing resin that makes embedding and layering possible. Polyester resin. It is a clear crystal clear resin used to make souvenirs or it is used as a laminating resin in the boat building and furniture industries. Unlike other resins, polyester resin uses an MEKP that is MEP catalyst which is added by number of drops per milliliter or ounce of resin. Epoxy clay. This resin is a clay. So when two parts are mixed together, instead of pouring into a mold, you can push it into a mold or vessel. Local examples of epoxy clay include MCL, which is used in the plumbing industries. The craft equivalent of MCL is Shilpakar, which is used to make small embellishments, murals and a lot of craft related products. Because of its strength, resin clay is an excellent adhesive and it's perfect for creating pave set jewellery where crystals will be permanently embedded once cured. It can also be sculpted, sanded and painted, making it suitable for home decor items also.
rubber. Rubber is widely used in the shoe industry as it is a non-slip, soft, durable and resilient material. In the 1900s, the first sneaker or the all-purpose athletic shoe with a rubber rim was designed. Rubber flip-flops or Hawaii chappal as they are popularly known have been popular in India for at least 50 years. Though rubber is majorly used for soles of shoes, it is increasingly used to create the entire shoe. The Brazilian rubber shoe line Melissa collaborated with designers like John Paul Gutier and Jason Wu to create rubber sandals. Even brands like Valentino, Chanel, Chloe, Juwanji, Burberry, Sergio Rossi and Jimmy Choo have all created high-end rubber shoes. Rubber jewellery was revolutionary in the 1980s. But today, it is common to see jewellery where a rubberized coating is given to an acrylic base. Also, we have seen rubber being used in the watch industry to create bright, colour-popping straps. Apart from natural rubber, most brands use synthetic rubber like silicon rubber and acrylic rubber today. PU PU or polyurethane is the material of choice presently in the footwear industry. Lightweight shoes, sandals and even beautiful flip-flops can be made out of polyurethane. Initially, only the soles were made of PU with injection molding to achieve lightweight and ergonomic shapes. But owing to its versatility, even entire shoes or entire sandals are made of this material today. PU shoes and sandals are washable, lightweight and extremely comfortable. These are also fashionable. The ability to achieve all sorts of colors and its adaptability to different forms make it versatile. Hence, it is used in footwear for men, women and children in both casual as well as party wear categories. Shoes where PU soles are decorated with four leather uppers and metallic leather straps have been doing the rounds for the last few years. Wood. Wood was once a niche material for accessories. Only the extremely fashion forward used to use it. However, in the last few years, it has surpassed its traditional stereotypes, becoming the it material for accessories. From chunky wooden heels of clogs to fashionable sandals and from talismanic pendants to industrial chic necklaces with gold hardware, wood has come a long way. Indian artisans have been traditionally making sandalwood and red sandalwood jewellery for their patrons. Here you can see an accessory that is used to hold a hair bun or a chignon. This is a wooden brooch that is made out of a piece of scrap wood and embellished using the polkey technique. Though the stones are made up of plastic, this brooch gives a very regal and traditional feeling. Many companies like B Wood specialize in making spectacle frames and watches out of wood. Woodworks is an Indian company that makes wooden bow ties, spectacle frames and wallets. Native Union makes cell phone cases, an accessory for the third limb of the modern times, your mobile phone. Even clutch bags, belt buckles and buttons used in garments can be made up of wood. Maple wood, walnut, ebony, oak wood and rosewood are the other prized woods that are used in accessory design.
glass. Though we hardly think about it, glass is one of the traditional materials in accessory design. From eyewear, that is lenses, to watches and jewellery, glass offers a touch of elegance and luxury that even the most common and generic of items stand apart. The precision cut lead glass crystals of Swarovski are prized for their cut, colour and clarity and they are no lesser than any semi-precious stone. In the present times, lamp for glass artists are in so much demand due to their exploratory skills in creating one-of-a-kind glass components and beads that can be used to make high-end jewellery. Polymers that are used in 3D printing. We cannot talk about fashion without talking about advances in technology. 3D printing is representative of our times. It is a technique where a three-dimensional object can be created using additive printing. So anything that we imagine, think of or sketch can be made into a real object. In this additive process, an object can be created by laying down successive layers of material based on, like I said, the 3D sketch of the item. Each of these layers is a thinly sliced horizontal cross section of an ensuing object. In the beginning, 3D printing was used only for prototyping and testing. It was also used to create original objects for casting molds. Slowly, with the availability of new raw materials, it is possible to print even using precious metals like silver or gold. Companies like Shapeface and Sculptio are pioneers in such 3D printing. So if you can think of a jewellery design or an object or an eyewear or a shoe, you can get it printed in your colour and material of choice today. Recycled materials. With the popularity of the DIY culture, that is the do-it-yourself culture, many items of everyday use like soda cans, pet bottles, newspapers and used garments get recycled and upcycled into accessories. You might know what recycling means, but what does upcycling mean? Upcycling means adding value to an existing or a used product. This might be with design, it might be by adding embellishments or adding certain other materials to it. Bottle cap earrings and brooches, t-shirt bags and newspaper pouches are some of the more popular accessories of the last decade. The non-anonymity of the material adds an individualistic quality to these items. Hence, they impart value and uniqueness. These are much preferred by those who are looking for unique, designer and well thought of accessories. With that, we come to the end of this module. In this module, looking back, we define what is texture. Texture is one of the seven elements of design and it is crucial to sensory stimulation. There are two types of textures, visual texture and tactile texture. We deliberated upon various materials that can be used to achieve these textures in accessories and jewellery. These materials range from textiles and leather to wood, metal and glass. With the advent of new technology, we have seen how materials like printed polymers, biopolymers and polyurethane are becoming the sinosure of the fashion industry. We also listed criteria for choosing a particular material or a combination of materials to create an accessory. To sum up, accessories can make or break your look. It can elevate your look in seconds. 
by using them creatively. You can style interesting looks that would suit your need, your occasion and your personality. Accessories and jewellery can be made out of a plethora of materials from precious stones and metal to plastic and even recycled materials like newspapers. Fashion trims are those that add value to garments and fashion accessories. With that, we come to the end of Unit 1, which is the introductory unit on fashion accessories and trims. In the following unit, we will discuss the fashion trims that we studied about in Unit 1, Module 1 in detail. We will identify sewing, finishing and packaging trims and discuss the criteria based on which they are selected. Thank you.